everybody. <clears throat> okay, here we go with some color theory. Um, if you would like, before you watch the video, you can um, download our color theory handout that you can find on Canvas and or I'll put it on our class website. Um, we're going to start with a little history of color theory. Okay, um, so in 1704, Sir Isaac Newton split white sunlight into red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And if you remember those from your childhood days, um, that's the Roy G. Bibb of the rainbow. And it is what we end up making our color wheel with to help us create harmonies and um, neutralize with complements so we can make really beautiful shades of color and create complexities within the color wheel. But it all started with the actual visual light spectrum. So all of it is based in physics. And when we start to learn about how um, working across the spectrum um, with our complements can cancel each other out with pigment to make really pretty um, neutralized tones, it's actually based in physics um, from the light spectrum that we see. Um, okay, so a little history here. This guy, Goethe, in um, 1810, he, so this is like 100 years after Isaac Newton um, separated the light into a prism, um, started to understand the effects of color on our psyche. And so if you were to ask my five-year-old if he knew the difference between warm and cool colors, he could. He would know that the the red and the orange and the yellow felt like warmth in the sun and that the blues, the violets, and the greens felt cool like the water or the grass. Um, and so he started to understand this and say that as we choose our colors, they can affect how we feel. And this is really all still based in Sir Isaac Newton's understanding because of the way that the wavelengths um, react to the cones and rods in the back of our eyes um, and how it affects us. So this is where we would divide our color wheel in half to have our warms and our cools. In comes our next guy. His name is Johannes Itten. And in 1919, he invented this color wheel. Um, he became a really um, important art theorist and color theorist from Switzerland. Um, and he was working then in Germany at the Bauhaus and was teaching this. Um, and this is the color wheel that today we use as painters for our subtractive understanding of color. So I'll show you how it translates for us. So this is what you call the colors painter wheel, and it's where he started. So here you have your primaries in the middle, <clears throat> yellow, blue, and red. These triangles are our secondaries where yellow and blue make green, blue and red make violet, yellow and red make orange, and we say violet because of Sir Isaac Newton instead of purple because of the Roy G. Bibb. So what has happened with this wheel is we have Roy, red, orange, yellow, G, green, blue, indigo is not really present, Bibb, violet. Um, so we've taken that spectrum and wrapped it around. But you'll see how you actually make the wheel from the primaries and the secondaries is that you take the um, you take, sorry, the yellow and point it out, the blue pointed out, the red pointed out. When they add to the secondaries, then that points out to this circle, this green points out to here, this violet points out to here, and we're starting to build our wheel. So then how that we get the um, tertiaries is that we add between them, and we always put the primary before the secondary. So you have yellow, green, blue green, blue violet, red violet, yellow orange, oops sorry, yellow orange, red orange, yellow green. So it's that primary before the secondary. So moving forward in the histories of the color wheel, we might have wondered how does this include pink or teal? Um, and up until this point, it really didn't. Um, but this is where we include something that we call tints, tones, and shades. And I'll explain that a little bit further later. But what happens with it is um, Munsell in 
1929 came up with this idea of adding value and chroma to a hue. So a hue is just the name of the color. Yellow, yellow, orange, orange, red, orange, red. But as you add dark, it's a shade. As you add gray, it's a tone. And as you add white, it's a tint. But this is where it gets really fun, and this is where the science of the physics comes in. If you take a complement, which is an opposite across it from itself on the color wheel, <clears throat> they cancel each other out. And this is more where our world that we visually see sits. We love these, what I'm going to call high chroma, or really bright colors. But it's these lower chroma that look like the world. So if you can even just see the scene behind me in my studio, there isn't much high chroma in it. It's really just the bright pinks, um, maybe in the, in the mural in the background. Um, but really most things are fairly low chroma. And so if we're trying to paint life or do it in a game video design or clothing, this is the range that we want to work on. And this is what we're going to try to do in our assignments is try to have some control over that. And it's pretty easy once we get the hang of it. So here is the uh, Munsell system again, where he's got value, the hue, and the chroma. And you can see where it would cut across. Just another example of it. You can see that the chroma, it's bright, and then it gets duller. And you would know, once we understand our color wheel, that if you're mixing yellow, the opposite of yellow is violet. And so it's these violets that are starting to turn these into these pretty, what we would call chromatic grays. Here it is again. This is what the Pantone system uses when we work on the computer or printing. Oops, sorry. Okay, so we in our class are exclusively going to be using the color system that is subtractive because we're using pigment. So the idea there is that if you have tubes of paint, they will never get brighter than what they start out with. So as soon as you mix them with anything, any other color, like if you mix a um, yellow and a blue together to make a green, it will be duller than those. Or if you mix a red and a green, a blue together to get a violet, it will be duller than those. It cannot be brighter. They just cancel each other out as they go. Um, and here is an example of it. So it tends towards black or brown when they start to mix together. So green and red are opposites on the color wheel. If we were using printmaking, um, so for books or magazines or actual printmaking studio, we are not going to be using the red, yellow, blue um, primary color that we learned in kindergarten or that we got from the rainbow of Sir Isaac Newton's, but we would be using cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Um, but I think that our system of um, red, yellow, blue works really well as a kindergarten method because even when we look at the printmaking method, it still feels red, yellow, and blue, and then cancels itself out. Um, and you still feel like you have green, violet, and orange, but it's just a different system for the different printing methods. Um, so ours is just theory, and we're going to use it as a checkpoint when we start mixing our paint. Additive color systems are when you're working with light. So what you see on the computer screen or a movie screen, theater screen, um, a video game, and it has a different effect. When you mix all of those colors together, they cancel themselves out to white. They get brighter and brighter and brighter. And this doesn't really concern us because we're not working on the computer. However, I think you can still apply the painter's color wheel subtractive method to this um, in theory because it still looks like reddish, yellow, and blue. Like it's still kind of in that same three grouping. So again, Here's the additive color, computers, um, ending in white. Okay, so here's a little vocabulary. And I've kind of said some of it, but the hue is the descriptive function of a color. Red is red and apple is red. However, if you paint an apple, you probably are not going to be painting with red. You might be painting with browns or maroons, depending on how 
that um, thing is seen in the world. So the apple is maroon and the moonlight um, is different than red. So this is the one I think that is most important for us. Again, I had said earlier that my studio was pretty low chroma. There isn't much that feels as bright as this bright um, safety vest orange. Maybe um, things that are trying to be sold to you, things that are safety equipment, um, things that are trying to catch your attention for marketing. But most things are pretty low chroma, like the camo with the desaturated colors on the right. And that's what we want to try and figure out how to make in our um, projects. Okay, so local color and optical color. Local is the idea of what you see. I know that an orange is orange, um, but optical would be if I was working from observation and painting that orange. Um, in our projects, we're going to really probably be working more on a local level, the idea or the conceptual idea of a color instead of looking at something observationally. So if you're in a figure drawing class, figure painting, drawing class, where you're working observationally, you're going to be working optically. But we're going to be um, the concept, the idea of the color. So here's just a recap. Hue is the name of the color. Red, blue, green, yellow, orange. High chroma, low chroma. Bright on the um, this side, duller on this side. And these are so beautiful. Our hope is once we start painting is to understand how we can create these and then do pops of really high chroma on top or in relationship to them to create really beautiful harmonies and juxtapositions. So here's our primary colors for our subtractive method with paint. Yellow, blue, and red. We mix those together to get our secondaries. Green, orange, blue and red make violet. So here's our secondary colors pulled out. Um, not so much now, but back in the day, if you would think of a children's nursery, you might have thought of using the primary colors. Um, now they have kind of changed their tune, but things are becoming more complicated. So literally, if you make a painting of primary colors, it will feel primary. It will feel basic. It will feel like a kindergarten at the beginning. Um, and then as the more that you mix your colors, the more sophisticated they will become. That's just how our brain kind of works to make them out because of the way that the, the physics works on our eyes. And then here's the tertiary colors, the ones that get pulled out being made by the one and the two put together, the primary and the secondary. So for instance, yellow, green, instead of green, yellow. Like so, one plus two equals three. So here's some color systems within the wheel, and this is how we can work out some harmonies. I think the best thing to do when you start working with color is pick colors that you love, but then choose along the way how you might um, do a checks and balance almost. Be like, oh, what was happening in my painting? Could I make it more monochromatic? Could I add something different? So a monochromatic painting or print or whatever I was subtractive would be one hue plus tints, tones, and shades. Analogous would be adjacent to each other or next to each other on the color wheel, which I'm going to tell you later is going to be my easy button. I think you can create an analogous painting and then use its opposite. So in this case, if blue is in the middle here, oops, sorry, um, then you could do little pops of orange or you could cancel out by using some orange. And here are complements. Red and green I remember because it's like Christmas. Blue and orange because it makes me think of a sports team. And yellow and violet because they're the hardest to mix together. <laughs> they're the hardest to mix together because violet, if we took this and turned it into a black and white color wheel, violet would be your darkest value and yellow would be your lightest value. So you're working with like the most extreme case and then that's what's making it challenging um, to mix them together. When you put complements next to one another, they shake um, and they create a real tension. That's why, like sports teams or big advertising campaigns, sometimes use bright primary color or excuse me, complementary colors um, to create this um, visual tension that's like almost hard to look at, but it, it sells. But when you mix your complements together, they cancel each other out, and this goes back to Sir Isaac Newton when on the vis visible light spectrum. Um, 
blue is on one side of the spectrum, orange is on the other side of the wavelength, and when they come together, they negate. <clears throat> so here's the example if we cut across the wheel, and this would be an example of the Munsell wheel showing the chroma change. So we're going to try and go for figuring out how we can make some of these chromatic grays by adding white. So this would be mixing just across the wheel without adding white, and then you get these really pretty neutralized colors by adding white within, which is a tint, adding a tint. So this was when I was saying there's an easy button using the split complement. If you um, choose a chunk that has a, a harmony to it and then you use its opposite, you can neutralize and you can set it on top unmixed and that's what makes those visual shakes that are so pretty. So again, high chroma and low chroma, we're going to try and learn how to mix low chroma because it's mixing. And then high chroma you can just take out of the tube, which is fun and great, but it, it's more complicated to understand how to make these kind of more sophisticated colors and that's what we're going to try and work on. So we've got a primary scheme, a secondary scheme, a tertiary scheme. I think you can see how um, they become more sophisticated as you go. Here's the color harmonies again, complements, analogous. Here's another example of the complements coming together where it's the, those vibrating boundaries and they're hard to look at. Here's where the complements are canceling each other out again. And this is what we think like, oh no, I'm making mud. But this is where we wanna live is somewhere in here or in here this is where it's adding white, so it's like this is how you would end up starting to make flesh tones. If you added more white, this is where you could like do a portrait and so forth. So that's when it gets pretty cool. These are the exact same designs with the exact same number. One, two, three, one, two, three. Like if you look, they're identical. But this one feels so much more complicated so much more complex because the colors have been neutralized and made more complicated. And that's what we're hoping for in our designs. Your warm colors, this goes back to Sir Isaac Newton, the warm colors are active and they're gonna push forward into the picture plane. And the cool colors are um, passive and they're gonna recede. So when you're trying to make your dynamic painting, you're gonna to wanna to have your warms be your highlights, your details, the things that push forward and those cools can sit in the back. So if you're thinking about building a negative space that's really painterly and washy, you could lay in like a really cool blue or a cool green and it's gonna sit back. You could neutralize that blue or green or violet by adding a little pinprick of its opposite and you can really push it so it desaturates and sits in the, in the background. And then your warms could be out of the two bright high chromas sitting on top. I'm gonna do a, a color mixing demo um, here in a bit. This I'm gonna talk about when I do the color mixing demo, but when we start mixing things, this is where we have problems. So this is a red called cad red light, cadmium red light, and it feels really orangey when you start to add white to it. You see how orange it becomes. And this alizarin crimson feels like pinky or violet. Um, it's a cool red. So all of our paints have a warm or a cool tendency, and this is where we get into mixing trouble. Um, so if you remember, orange and blue are opposite in the color wheel, but it's blue and red that make violet. So if I use an orangey red to make a violet, I'm canceling out the blue with the orange, making a muddy purple. But if I use a red that's already tending cool, um, and having that kind of violet lean, then I add that with the blue and I'm gonna get a really jewely, pretty kind of color. So I will talk about this when we start the demo with paint because this is where people get into trouble. So when you start your color project number five, which is the dynamic design, I want you to come up with a kind of color palette like this. And so when you look at this Mona Lisa by Da Vinci, it's not that you would think that it would necessarily be those colors out of the gate, but you can see that he has a whole large portion of the composition built with these kind of cooler darks. 
and then the focal point are these warmer colors sitting on top. So by no means is his whole color scheme just these colors, but that's how we want to think about color theory is kind of simplifying down our design to some basics and then we can add little pops of things within. So here, this Claw Monet, same thing. Like I feel like the things that are most important in this painting are actually these little pops of warmth, these little pinks and reds and so forth and the bright yellows in the foreground. But 90%, if not more, of the painting are made with these really beautiful cools. And then it's those opposites that kind of sing and kind of dance on top of it. And you'll notice that there's so much of a value range happening in here. And that's something that happens when we start painting, is we forget about 100, 70, 50, 30, 0. And that's why Monet's are pretty amazing, because he hangs on to all that. So that's what we want to work on, too. This Botticelli, he's using compliments as the metaphor. So he has the um, blue and the orange, which are opposite in the color wheel, which are creating a tension over the birth of Venus, um, which is kind of beautiful. And then when you look at his color palette again, it's pretty neutralized, it's pretty boring, and it's not accounting for these high chroma things, but it's creating that full structure for these kind of higher chroma, more beautiful kind of moments with the pink flying and so forth. This is a Matisse, and often this would be the painting that a lot of people in the museum would say, oh, it looks like my two-year-old could do it. Um, it we, they could not. <laughs> um, it's pretty sophisticated, but it is functioning more by having, as its big kind of understanding, you have the reds, the blues, and the yellows, which are your primaries, which feels more like kindergarten. He steps us outside and gets into our oranges and our yellows and our violets, and so it starts to have that more complementary, or excuse me, that secondary palette as you shift out the window, and there's other parts where he has that complexity happening. Um, but on top of that, it's not just the color that is less sophisticated. Oh, and there's not really tints, tones, and shades. They're like super high chroma, which makes it really flat. But it also, um, there's very little overlapping. The diminishing scale is not working. Um, so it's just flattening. So this would be as static as it gets, which I love. It's really beautiful. But this is a Picasso. And this whole era um, was four years. It was called this blue period followed by a rose period. But what you'll notice in the slide is that it's not really a blue period. If you look at these highlights, they're peach. Like they're kind of a warmish, um, orangey kind of color. And these um, complicated blues, he clearly did not make a monochromatic painting with just blue, white, gray, and black. He was using that complement of blue um, being orange to make these more complicated color palettes. Um, and so that's a simple way to create a harmony and a kind of, um, in this case, a kind of tragedy, a kind of sadness because of that more neutralized color palette, more sophisticated. This is what we might call um, a local color the idea of an orange is being orange and it's all painted with just that color, a little bit of yellow, but not really. It's more that it's just the yellow or the orange has been so lightened with the water. But this one would be more like um, your optical color where you can see that there's so many different shades happening within and you can see all this violet that's balancing against these yellows across the way these bright blues that are making these oranges really pop, all of these different layers of value and complexity happening here and in here. These are those really neutralized colors. Um, and so this is kind of maybe something that I want us to investigate in our tests because that's harder to pull off. This one where the subject is predominantly red, pink, but we'll just call that red um, for our theory part. And then our brain would say that this background is pretty gray, but when you really look at it, you see that it's it's very green. And it's that green gray, that desaturated neutralized gray that's giving these reds and pinks such a beautiful pop. You can see that the darks are actually really rich violets. Um, he has some super high chroma greens happening here. 
to create even more tension. He, this is a woman, Maggie Sinar. This pretty green here, they're pretty rich in their value. This is a split compliment um, by Jenny Seville, and I think we could all agree that this painting is much more emotional than some of the other ones. And what she's got going is she has the yellows and the violets and the blues and kind of the oranges um, happening. So it's like that much more complex um, set of colors that are happening. And the thing on this one that I think is really important is if we were to photocopy this into black and white, you would have 100s, 70s, 30s, zeros, 50s. She's got the full rich complexity. You can see these super pretty neutralized grays that don't look muddy because they're mixed against these higher chroma spots. And it makes a world for the emotional part of the painting to really pop out. This one seems like um, a vocabulary word I haven't said yet, but the word disharmonious, which means it's got all the color schemes happening in it at once, um, which can work, but this person definitely had a plan. Um, the base, the big background, is mostly green, and the opposite of green is red, which takes us visually through the space. And then the two or three subjects, I guess, there's the box, the little boxes, and the troll. Um, well, first, this is a white studio box that we would understand um, in our um, drawing classroom. Sorry, try and get this to go away. Um, but it's really not white. She's used all this violet in here. She's brought some of her greens as a bounce light. But it's these violets that balance so nicely between the yellow of the hair and the yellow of the cubes in front, which is really cool. Um, so she's got the complements and the complements that are working. And lots of really good dark darks. These beautiful, rich 100s. But it happens outside of painting as well. This is the box trolls, and it's predominantly blue and orange, creating the color scheme. Saving Private Ryan. Most likely this movie was not shot on a dreary, sad day over hours or days when they did these scenes. This would have been done in post um, when they were editing the movie, and they would have drugged their sliders of... Um, green and red together to get that grayed down color, creating that psychological effect of feeling kind of overwhelming and sad like it would have in the Picasso. Um, so using those complements. Here you have a, um, the matrix, um, which is super otherworldly. And in this, you've got the super, super black, right out of the tube, crushed velvet black. But then these greens are really acidic and kind of weird and plasticky looking, which feels like another world. Um, but if you remember the Matrix, when they're actually in the real world, not the fake world, they're all wearing really beautiful gray, expensive looking sweaters. <laughs> but it's really dull down opposite of this super high chroma space that um, and high contrast that is here. So I'm going to close it out here. This is a website that you can find either on the computer or on your phone. If you go on your phone, you have to log in, but you can just use uh, email to make a login. But what happens here um, is that you can do all of the color theory live um, through Adobe. So I'm going to get out of this screen really quickly, and I'll show you. Um, what I mean. Go to Adobe Color. Let it pull up here. So what is really cool is you can click and you can see the analogous. You can see a monochromatic. You can see a triad, and you can move it around. So I'm going to take these out further, and you can see them get brighter 
and higher chroma um, down in the color thing here. I'm going to go to complementary. You can see it really well there. So they're really bright. And this is basically the Munsell color wheel live. So watch as I drag them together. They neutralize, add value, add white, and they cancel each other out. And that's when we get really pretty colors. So we just have to figure out how to do that with paint, which I'll do in a bit. Yeah, I'm another video. The split complement. So it's kind of neat that you can see how it can unfold in different ways. Um, you can extract themes. So you could put a picture here. And then it can help you make a color palette. So let's say um, my brand story is ephemeral blooms, which it is. I could throw in a picture of flowers and then have it help me pick my color palette. I can use none on it. I could have it pick a dark one for me, a deep one, a muted one, a bright one. This is how people create mood boards, a colorful one. Um, so it's really cool. Um, and you can do this on your phone too. Okay, so that is an intro to color theory. Um, I will have a video soon showing us how to mix color, and that is when it's going to get really fun. Okay, hope you guys are doing well. See you soon. Bye.